case, at least I won't be proud as I leave the building. So I won't commit the sin of pride. A missionary was working amongst a primitive tribe of people. And um, as he tried to translate the Bible into their dialect, he hit the problem with the word pride. There was no word in their language for pride. So what translators have to do is just watch the people and look for a substitute word. And the nearest he could get to was ear. Ear. And he came up with a translation that your ears are too far apart for the word pride. In other words, you've got a big head. You've got a big head. And so pride in that local dialect is your ears are too far apart. Your head is too big. Now, when it comes to pride, there is, of course, good pride and bad pride. Good pride is when we are focused elsewhere. For example, a husband might be proud of his wife, and rightly so. And a wife might be proud of her husband, rightly so. Parents will be proud of their children and what their children achieve. And vice versa, we hope. We may take pride in a job well done. In fact, the Bible says find satisfaction in all their toil. It is a gift from God. So if you do a job well, you can take pride in what you have achieved. There is good pride. There's a time when you can enjoy boasting in good things. But the bad pride is when it is self-focused. Self-focused. Too much confidence and reliance on self. When we boast about our own achievements in the wrong way our own possessions our own position our own skills now why is pride so bad because at the heart of pride is rebellion against God it is a life lived independent I don't need God I'm good enough to live my life my way how I want and it's bad in a Christian because as a Christian we can be self-sufficient We can say, of course, we believe in God and have all the answers, but then go out and foolishly live like an atheist. We only bring God into this situation when it suits us. And the Bible refers to pride in several ways. Self-exaltation, haughtiness, puffed up, lofty, conceit, arrogance, boastfulness. And pride has many faces and takes many forms. And often the person who is the most proud is unaware that pride exists or is a problem in their lives. A clergyman from the past, Caleb C. Colton, remarked, Pride, like the magnet, constantly points to one object, self. Unlike the magnet, it has no attracting pole, but at all points it repels. And we can so often see pride clearly in others, but we don't see it. In our own lives. Now, pride is the mother of all sins. It is a sin that causes so many other sins. It was because of pride that Satan led the celestial rebellion in heaven and got kicked out in the first place. It was because of pride that human beings fell in the Garden of Eden and the world was messed up once and for all. It was pride that caused Cain to kill his brother Abel. The very first murder was over pride. Man couldn't humble his heart and come the right way. It was pride at the Tower of Babel that caused division and confusion amongst the nations. Pride is the mother of all sins. And so pride is bad because ultimately it is always rebellion against God and his ways. And that's what we have illustrated for us in our passage this morning. Now let me give you the pig picture and it could be confusing or it might make sense. It made sense to me but I don't know if you've ever seen this illustration. A man looked out his window and he saw a bird after a worm. Then he saw a cat after the bird and then he noticed the dog after the cat. So you've got the worm being eaten by the bird and the bird being eaten by the cat and the cat being eaten by the dog. Now, that is the picture in Isaiahs 9 and 10. Let me illustrate what I mean. The worm is little Judah. Little Judah. Just a small southern kingdom where the capital Jerusalem is. 
It's made up of two tribes, Judah and Benjamin, and it has the capital city. These are the true people of God. The bird that's going to attack or wants what uh, Judah has is Israel, the northern kingdom, where there were ten tribes. They kept the name Israel, but actually they weren't the true Israel. So Israel would love to conquer or love to have what Judah has. The cat, further north, yeah, we got the worm, we got the bird, the cat, that's the kingdom of Syria, which is bigger and stronger than Israel and Judah and wants a bit of the party, wants to take over. And then the dog, the biggest animal of all, was Assyria in the north. They were a military power that was building an empire. They will sweep all the way before it. So when we come to these chapters, think of this. The dog, Assyria, is going to attack the cat, Syria. They're going to attack the bird, Israel, who's going to attack the worm. So the worm is going to look for the dog to chase off the cat and the bird. Is that confusing or does it make sense? Hopefully it makes sense. But there's a problem. You see, if little Judah goes to bigger Syria and says, come and fight my enemies for me, and he gets rid of them, what happens then if the dog turns on the worm and has that as well? And that's the scenario, that's the situation that we're picking up in chapters 9 and 10. This is what the prophet is saying is going to happen. Don't trust other nations for your protection, trust God. Now this passage divides under three headings, three messages from God delivered by Isaiah the prophet. One message to Israel, the other message to the nations, and one to Judah. Now, if you haven't figured it out already, the land of uh, Israel is split into two. The northern kingdom is called Israel, ten tribes. The south is called Judah with two tribes. So the 12 tribes are in one land. Civil war split it. Ten tribes in the north, two in the south. So he'll speak to the northern kingdom. He'll speak to the nations around the northern kingdom. And then he'll speak to the south. Let's look at message number one. Israel's, sorry, Isaiah's message to Israel. It's a three-minute reading, so we'll have it on the screen. Dave, crank up the volume. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it, Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria, who say with pride and arrogance of heart, the bricks have fallen down, but we will rebuild with dressed stone. The fig trees have been felled, but we will replace them with cedars. But the Lord has strengthened reason's foes against them and has spurred their enemies on. Arameans from the east and Philistines from the west have devoured Israel with open mouth. Yet for all this, his anger is not, is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. But the people have not returned to him who struck them, nor have they sought the Lord Almighty. So the Lord will cut off from Israel both head and tail, both palm branch and reed in a single day. The elders and dignitaries of the head, the prophets who teach lies of the tail. Those who guide this people mislead them, and those who are guided are led astray. Therefore the Lord will take no pleasure in the young men, nor will he pity the fatherless and widows. For everyone is ungodly and wicked, every mouth speaks folly. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. His hand is still upraised. Surely wickedness burns like a fire. It consumes briars and thorns. It sets the forest thickets ablaze so that it rolls upwards in a column of smoke. By the wrath of the Lord Almighty, the land will be scorched and the people will be fuel for the fire. They will not spare one another. On the right they will devour but still be hungry. On the left they will eat but not be satisfied. Each will feed on the flesh of their own offspring. Manasseh will feed on Ephraim, and Ephraim on Manasseh. Together they will turn against Judah. Yet for all this, his anger is not turned away. 
his hand is still upraised. Isaiah chapter... Oh, sorry. I think I pressed too early there, but we'll leave it there. Let me go back to my slide. Get there. It's going to be one of those days. What was the problem in that reading? What is the problem with Israel that Isaiah delivers a message? Well, it's clearly there in verse 9. Pride and arrogance. Pride and arrogance of the heart. The Lord has sent a message against Jacob. It will fall on Israel. All the people will know it. Ephraim and the inhabitants of Samaria who say with pride and arrogance of the heart. Pride can be defined as high regard for yourself. Arrogance can be overbearingly proud of the way you look down or relate to other people. And pride and arrogance is what dominates Israel in the north. Muhammad Ali, the famous boxer, was nicknamed the greatest. And of course, he shot to fame because in radio and television interviews, he would shout down the microphone and stare into the camera, I am the greatest! And people thought, that big head, I'm going to buy a ticket just to see someone humble him. And of course, not many people did. He became world champion three times, probably the greatest sportsman or boxer that there has been. But he had a bit of an ego. And one time, he's on a 747 traveling across America. And the flight attendant, uh, just as the plane's about to take off, is walking around, checking everyone's got their seatbelts on. And Muhammad Ali sat there with his seatbelt loosened and she said sir could you please fatten your seatbelt and this is what Muhammad Ali said he said Superman he doesn't need a seatbelt Superman doesn't need a seatbelt and straight away the stewardess replied Superman he doesn't need an aeroplane now fasten your seatbelt and if you'll forgive the pun even Muhammad Ali had feet of clay Arrogance, pride, that's the people in the north. What's God's response to his people? It's anger, anger. God gets angry. But don't equate the anger of God as the same as human anger. See, I get angry all the time. People wind me up in traffic queues and shopping queues and irritable things annoy me. People leaving lights on. You come home and they've left the back door open. There's no one in the house. Come on, burglars, help yourself. Things really wind you up. And and, and my anger is sometimes misdirected or it comes from a sinful heart. And it's an overreaction. So human anger is often misplaced or wrong. God's anger is never misplaced. It's never wrong. It is always righteous anger that leads to righteousness. So the anger of God is different to human anger. It has a purpose. It is just and it has a righteous outcome. Now did you notice the repetition in our reading? Four times one phrase is constantly repeated. It's repeated in verse 12, verse 17 and verse 21 of chapter 9. And in case you missed it, in chapter 10 verse 4 it's repeated again. Because the chapter breaks were put in by humans, not by Isaiah. So in these one message, four times the expression, yet for all this, his anger is not turned away, his hand is still upraised. See, these people have to realise something. They think their biggest aggressor is Syria or Assyria. They think that's their biggest problem. And God says, no, 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 I'm your biggest problem. These are just... People, humans, I'm the biggest problem. Don't worry about them. Worry about me and your relationship to me. So God himself is their problem. And as a father disciplines his wayward child, so God will discipline his people. As a shepherd, even aggressively, will grab hold of a sheep and force it back. Take it out of the danger it's placed itself in, even at great distress to the sheep, and carry it home. God says, I will rescue my people and take them home. So that's the first message. Israel, their problem is arrogance and pride, and God says, we're going to deal with it. You might not like the way I deal with it, but I'm God, and you're not. Here's the second message. Isaiah's message to the nations. 
Isaiah's message to the nations. Chapter 10, verse 5 to 19. Let's hear it read again, shall we? Woe to the Assyrian, the rod of my anger, in whose hand is the club of my wrath. I send him against a godless nation. I dispatch him against a people who anger me to seize loot and snatch plunder and to trample them down like mud in the streets. But this is not what he intends. This is not what he has in mind. His purpose is to destroy, to put an end to many nations. Are not my commanders all kings, he says? Has not Kalno fared like Carchemish? Is not Hamath like Arpad and Samaria like Damascus? As my hand seized the kingdoms of the idols, kingdoms whose images excelled those of Jerusalem and Samaria, shall I not deal with Jerusalem and her images as I dealt with Samaria and her idols? When the Lord has finished all his work against Mount Zion and Jerusalem, he will say, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. For he says... By the strength of my hand I have done this, and by my wisdom, because I have understanding. I removed the boundaries of nations, I plundered their treasures. Like a mighty one, I subdued their kings. As one reaches into a nest, so my hand reached for the wealth of the nations. As people gather abandoned eggs, so I gathered all the countries. Not one flapped a wing or opened its mouth to chirp. Does the axe raise itself above the person who swings it? Or the saw boast against the one who uses it? As if a rod were to wield the person who lifts it up, or a club brandish the one who is not wood. Therefore the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will send a wasting disease upon his sturdy warriors. Under his pomp a fire will be kindled like a blazing flame. The light of Israel will become a fire, the Holy One a flame. In a single day it will burn and consume his thorns and his briars. The splendor of his forests and fertile fields it will completely destroy, as when one who is ill wastes, wastes away. And the remaining trees of his forests will be so few that a child could write them down. In that day... Oh, so it's that extra verse I missed, isn't there? God's message to the nations, especially to Assyria. He's got one of the best names in literature. He's a great villain, uh, written by a man who was born down the road in Pompey, in Portsmouth, probably that direction, isn't it? Uh, Charles Dickens. And he appears in the book David Copperfield. His name is Uriah Heap. I mean, what a fantastic name, Uriah Heap. And if you've read the book or seen the film, you know that he has a repetitive phrase that he likes to use again and again, and again. And when Uriah Heap first meets David Copperfield, he says, I am well aware that I am the humblest person going. Humblest person going. And he loves to tell him about his humble abode, where he lives. And having picked up so much humbleness at school. And of course, it's a fantastic phrase that fits a fantastic character. And by talking and boasting about his humbleness... Is actually doing the opposite. It's desire, selfishness and pride that fills the man all the way through. Now, this second message of Isaiah breaks into two parts. First, we have information regarding Assyria. And notice in verse 12, pride is the problem again with the king of Assyria. And then second, there is encouragement to the remnant. Now, a remnant is a group of Jewish believers who will survive the Assyrian invasion. Only a few, a remnant, will be saved. And God speaks to them. So, first of all, information regarding Assyria. Assyria is modern northern Iraq. They had a huge empire that stretched from Egypt to Antalya in Turkey. And they became famous for their cruelty in battle. Next time you're in London, go to the British Museum 
Ask to see the Assyrian room. I think it's room 6 or 12. But ask to see the Assyrian room. And you can actually go online and do an online virtual tour. It's a fantastic place. And you will see they've taken kind of wall carvings. There's a, there's a room and it's just side by side of these wall carvings. And the inscriptions bring to life the power of the Assyrian Empire and the cruelty of their people, their armies, what they did to other nations. And if you get a tour where someone explains it, it'll bring it alive. It's fantastic. But they were one of the most terrifying armies that have existed because they were super organized. They were well led. They were well fed. They were well supplied. They had weapons above their enemies. So when they fought, they always won. No one defeated the Assyrians in military battle. And in the British Museum, you can see this illustrated perfect history brought alive. Now, God used Assyria in verses 5 and 11 to, be the, to bring judgment upon his people Israel in the north. God often used Israel to bring judgment on other nations, but when they misbehaved, it was reversed. The other nations brought judgment on Israel. Their capital, Samaria, was taken. And in verses 12 to 19, there's another twist in the narrative. Assyria, too, will... Those who brought judgment on God's people are about to be judged themselves. And this happens because of the boastful pride of their king, Tigla Pilisa. Verse 12 says, his heart was corrupt. We know the same, power corrupts and total power corrupts totally. That's what happened to this king. Full of pride, full of arrogance, full of self-boasting. And the Lord says, I will punish the king of Assyria for the willful pride of his heart and the haughty look in his eyes. And if you look at verse 13 and 14, the words that stand out, I, I, me, my. It's megalomania. He assumes he can do whatever he likes because he's the king of Assyria. And when Assyria comes knocking, you better open or I'll kick the door down. And then in verses 15 to 19, we're told that God will allow Assyria to go so far, but not further than God designs. And verse 19 is very telling and very sad. Because when Assyria comes to Jerusalem, they get to the gates, but no further. And then the army is defeated, not by battle, but by plague, by disease. And verse 19 says, they'll be so decimated that a child can count the number of soldiers left in the defeated army. Now, as far as I'm aware, kids normally count up to 10 because they've got 10 fingers. If you want to use your toes, you've got 20. But this almighty army is going to be reduced to a handful that a kid can count. So that's the message of Assyria. And then there's a little message to the remnant. Defeat might be what is the common experience of Israel and most of Judah, but it won't be total defeat. And three questions are mentioned in verse 20 and 24. Question one, how much of Judah will be destroyed by the Assyrian army? Most of it. And there's a list of cities they take on their way towards Jerusalem. Question two, how long will the Assyrians occupy the land? Surprisingly, just a short time. Question three, how near will the Assyrian army get to Jerusalem, the capital? Right to the gates, but they won't enter in. So that's the second message. Let's look at this third and final message. It's only very short. Therefore, this is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. My people who live in Zion, do not be afraid of the Assyrians who beat you with a rod and lift up a club against you as Egypt did. Very soon my anger against you will end, and my wrath will be directed to their destruction. The Lord Almighty will lash them with a whip, as when he struck down Midian at the rock of Oreb, and he will raise his staff over the waters as he did in Egypt. In that day their burden will be lifted from your shoulders, their yoke from your neck. The yoke will be broken because you have grown so fat. They enter Aiath. They pass through Migron. They store supplies at Michmash. They go over the pass and say, 
We will camp overnight at Jeba. Rema trembles. Gibeah of Saul flees. Cry out, daughter Galim. Listen, Laisha. Poor Anathoth. Madmina is in flight. The people of Jebim take cover. This day they will halt at Nob. They will shake their fist at the mount of daughter Zion, at the hill of Jerusalem. See, the Lord, the Lord Almighty, will lop off the boughs with great power. The, lo the lofty trees will be felled. The tall ones will be brought low. He will cut down the forest thickets with an axe. Lebanon will fall before the mighty one. Third message to Judah. And it's a message of encouragement that Jerusalem will not fall. And this Assyrian army, who their king in verse 14 says, I am the mighty one, discovers actually God is the almighty one. There is someone bigger and stronger. And God will cause them to go no further than reach the gates of Jerusalem before a plague comes and the army are literally wiped out, wiped out. Well, that's the passage. How does it apply? Well, we called it the sin of pride. And I guess that's the thing we ought to take home with us. Don't be proud. Independent of God. You know, Ebenezer Wooten was a, an evangelist and he had a, a crusade with his marquee, his tent in a village. And just as they were packing up, a young man ran to him and said, Mr. Wooten, Mr. Wooten, am I too late? What must I do to be saved? And Mr. Wooten knew that the crusade was over. And he said, uh, yeah, it's too late. And the man went, what? Is there anything I can do to be saved? And Mr. Witten said, it's too late. You're 2,000 years too late. There's nothing you can do to be saved. It's been done for you in the person of Jesus Christ. And if you come humbly, and you don't depend on your good works and your charitable disease, the, the, deeds or disease, your charitable deeds, your church, if you don't try and self-effort, you come humbly with nothing in your hands to bring, simply to the cross you cling, you can be saved, but you can't save yourself. God resists the proud, but he shows grace to the humble. We all come the same way. No one comes in their pride. I'm good enough for God. That pride, as we found it in our house groups Thursday night, is like rags rubbed in excrement. That's how God sees our good deeds and our works when we try and depend on them for salvation. We are saved by grace, by God's mercy. And we live the same way. We cannot live the Christian life in our own strength. Jesus said, without me you can do nothing. The branch must remain in the vine, else it cannot produce anything. And a Christian who tries to live for Christ in their own strength will always, always fail. The command is trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your path straight. That's how we live the Christian life, by trusting in the Lord. And you've got a choice. You can live on the battery system or you can plug into the mains. If you live on the battery system, your Christian life will be like a jolly yo-yo, up and down, up and down. You'll have highs and you'll have lows, highs and lows. Look like a mountain range if it was a graph. But if you plug into the means you'll have a constancy a constant flow of God's power in your life and you can live on the battery system and fail miserably that's human pride I can do it my way or the wise person each day says God I can't but you can fill me with your spirit lead me this day I need to trust in you with all my heart and that's the choice we have the warning from Isaiah 9 and 10 is don't be self-sufficient Trust in the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we covered a lot of ground. And uh, your word, Lord, we don't apologize for. Help us to glean secondhand lessons from it so that we don't have to experience the same folly or your anger and judgment. Lord, help us to walk with the Lord in the light of his word. So bless it to us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's conclude with a final song and then it's cup of tea time. Oh, worship the Lord. Oh, worship the King even. Oh, glories above. Oh, gratefully sing of his power and his love. Our shield, our defense.